My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the North, general of the Felix Legions, loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where we return for part two of Ridley Scott's Gladiator. When we left our hero, Maximus, in part one, he had realized that success in the arena was the only thing that could bring him face to face with his enemy, the Emperor Commodus. And now, before the final act of his life begins, Maximus has time for a quiet conversation with the closest thing he has to a friend, his fellow gladiator, Juba. It's somewhere out there, my country, my home. My wife is preparing food. My daughters carry water from the river. Will I ever see them again? I think no. Do you believe you'll see them again when you die? I think so. But then, I will die soon. They will not die for many years. I'll have to wait. But you would wait? Of course. You see, my wife and my son are already waiting for me. You'll meet them again, but not yet. And this was not in the original script because this idea of the afterlife was added by a different writer. Mm. Um, it's funny how it all comes together, though. It really, really, it really is. The editor of this film just deserves a lot of credit. Well, and he's on the set, by the way. So the way they're doing oh, it, and this smart. is a new piece of technology. So, so the movie's shot on film, but they have a, a video tap that's pulling a digital, like a video stream mm -hmm. off of it, and it's recorded onto, it's 2000, so it's probably recorded onto tape. And then he is editing every night with what's been shot that Holy day. crap. So he's editing video every night and coming back to them the next day and saying, maybe this, maybe that. Wow. So because, and as the script is constantly changing, he's constantly trying it out. I can't imagine continuity on a film like this. No, it's crazy. Commodus is watching Lucius sleep. Mm -hmm. Creepy. <laughs> Um, Lucilla enters, um, and Commodus is lying as he sleeps so well because he knows he is loved. Again, it's that this is where Ridley Scott's trying to make us feel sympathy for this guy. Well, then you don't have you don't have Joaquin act the way he acts if you're trying to get sympathy. For That's this what guy. I think. Yeah. Um, Lucilla brings him a tonic. Is she drugging him? I think she's calming him down. And I don't know. Maybe she's drugging him. Maybe he he reacts to that to the whatever she brings him. He, she knows he reacts to that in a certain way. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if there's a little something here. Right. Um, and I think he's the father of the child. You think he's Lucius's dad? Oh, yes. Oh, I don't. I don't know. I mean, Lucius, there's a guy who's dead, we know. Um, and well, and this is where we get into it. He asks, will you stay with me? Will you stay with me? I'm still afraid of the dark, brother. Still. Always. Stay with me tonight. You know I won't. And kiss me. There's no question in my mind there's history here. Yes. There's no question in my mind that he has made some kind of advances on her. The degree to which she's reciprocated and what's actually happened, I don't know. I wonder if he's like used that excuse before to trick her into sleeping. Oh, I'm sure he yeah. has. And and tried to have sex with her, yeah. Yeah. I, or I, had I, sex with her. Yeah, but that's, that's where we don't know. But it's clearly a horrible... Yeah horrible, difficult relationship. And you can see, and that's why she's, what makes her such a sympathetic character, she's completely trapped. Yes. And she's trying her best to do the best she can. She's the sympathetic one. Oh yeah. Do the whole movie. Without question. Yeah. Um, well, no, what I will say that's a little, is there are times where we're not 100% sure of her motives. I think if you go back, get to the end of the movie and look back through the whole thing or see it the next time, you're 100% right. Yes. The first time I saw it, I'm like, wait, well, what's going on here? That's the enjoyment of the drama. Um, our, our gladiators have arrived in Rome. Um, Rome's big city. Big city. <laughs> there are elephants and women are calling out to them and... There's all sorts of betting going on and we're heading towards the Coliseum and that thing is big. And it's digital. It is. So no. So 
ex the exterior shot is digital. Yes, that's what I interior. Mean. When we go in interior, it's one story is practical, is built on the set, and the next two or three, I think it's I forget how many stories, how many stories the Coliseum actually. Yeah, but the next ones are all digital. Yeah, um, and it's this thing mixed together, and this is where this is state of the art at this yeah. time. Yeah, I mean, we worked on this disc uh, at uh, Testronics, like when I was working there doing QC, and I watched the special features numerous times. Right, so you see the digital recreations, where and I would encourage you if you have, if you own the disc to watch the special features. It's really incredible what really it really is. Do. Um, have you been to the Coliseum in Rome? No, I've never been to Rome. I want to go to. That's like the one of the top four places I want to go. My sister is in Rome right now oh, as nice. we speak. Uh, Rome's amazing, and the Coliseum is, you know, just as astounding as as you as you can imagine. I'm sure it is a huge, amazing place. And 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 of course, as we enter into the Coliseum, that's when uh, Proximo find, finds out that they're going to be in the Battle of Carthage. Yes, and not in the role of the winners. <laughs> and so he's like, "Well, that's terrible. I want double the money." By the way, I love that. I think it's David Hemmings. Is that guy? Who yes, plays, David yeah, Hemmings. Who we know from Blow Up, right? And those, oh, right. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it's fascinating to see how old and different he looked as he got older. Because uh, when he's younger, he's unrecognizable to yeah. what he it turns out to looking like when he's older. But that voice is is unmistakable. Yeah, that raspy old British voice. And those eyebrows and the eyebrows, which they're are real. great. Yes, yeah, so of those course are they're real. real eyebrows. He's had them in numerous movies. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, they're great eyebrows. <laughs> um, and uh, Lucius comes up to the bars of the the where the gladiators are held yeah. to talk to Maximus. Gladiator, are you the one they call the Spaniard? Yes. They said you were a giant. They said you could crush a man's skull with one hand. A man's? No. Boys, <laughs> yeah, That's right. Great. Just to mess with him, yeah. And you know, he's like, "Oh, I like you, Spaniard. I'll cheer for you." And Maximus is like, "Why did your father let you come to the glad you know to the call scene to see this stuff?" And he goes, "Oh, my uncle says it makes you strong." And then we find out his father is dead. And then he asks his name, Lucius Ferris, after my father. And now Maximus knows who this is. Yeah, almost time for battle. What does Maximus do right before a battle? Grab some dirt. Yep. Yep. Again, this, as you said, the connection to the land, the mm -hmm. dirt, the sand. Um, rituals were a really important thing in cinema. Repetition, mm -hmm. because they, they they create meaning as you repeat them. Yep. Um, and he picks out a helmet. Great, yeah. great design Very on that good. helmet. And now we're told we're going to go out and die with honor. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and we walk into the arena. And I love that they're just stunned and overwhelmed by the size of the place. I'm assuming at some point you've walked into the middle of a stadium like this. Yes. Uh, it is. I did a pilgrimage in 1998 when I was there for London, to study in London. And uh, France had won the World Cup that summer. Mm. So um, we were there for three days in Paris. And one of those days, uh, we were allowed to go wherever we wanted to go. And, you know, people went to Notre Dame, whatever. I took a pilgrimage all the way out to the Stade de France to see the stadium mm. where the French had won the World Cup. I'd never been to a soccer stadium like that. Right. I'd only ever been to American soccer stadiums. Right. And so it, it took me four train rides to get there. It was so far. And then I walked a mile and a half from the last stop, I think, all the way to the stadium. And the stadium was open for tours. Wow. So I was able to take a tour of the stadium. I have pictures of myself with the World Cup, like hold, like looking at the World Cup. It's in a case, obviously. And then down on the first tier with the grass behind me. And it was breathtaking to walk yeah. into the stadium and see and it was empty but to walk into the stadium where yeah. i'd seen on tv this team win the world cup only a few months before it was incredible incredible it, it, there's some about spaces like that and mm -hmm. and to and just what i walked into i was in the cal stadium which is a big stadium uh -huh. in the middle of the night by myself because we had broken in <laughs> when i was a freshman in college that's fine no and way. then and then statue of limitations yeah. is done by now you're good i've been at dodger stadium and yeah, dodger. and being in these places it's like kind of awe-inspiring and mm -hmm. overwhelming and now we combine this with oh and by the way you're about to die yes you know and so the the decision you know ridley scott is asking his effects people because remember only one level of this stadium mm -hmm. is built the rest doesn't exist and he's asking them well what can i do what how can i shoot this you know to put it on sticks and we'll do a plate shot or whatever and they and the fx guy goes no 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 wait a minute if you could do anything what would you do and he said, well, if I could do anything, I'd do a 360 steady cam shot that's wrapping around them as they experience the stadium. 
And he goes, okay, that's what we're going to do. Damn. And nothing like this had ever been done. Wow. I mean, because because the, something to understand is like the easiest thing to do, like I'm, I'm looking at you right now. Yeah. And if I wanted you to disappear, let's say, I put my camera, I put it on a tripod. I film you doing the scene and then I have you get up and walk out mm -hmm. without moving the camera and then I roll the camera again and then I can dissolve from one image to the other and you will disappear. Right. So as long as nothing is moving, everything is pretty easy. As soon as things start to move, then it gets harder, you know, to to add things or subtract things because right. in three dimensions, everything moves at different rates, at different, you know, speeds, different distances. There's a foreshortening that's happening, size change that's happening. It's really, really complicated. Yeah. Which is why when Star Wars... When the big advances in Star Wars is motion controlled cameras, which meant that I can do a camera move and then I can do the exact same camera move again at the exact same speed in the exact same way and it becomes predictable. And that's how you could do all these passes on people with models in the background or foregrounds right. and combine them all. And then with computers, you could do more, but still like being able to move the camera around is really difficult. If the camera is on a track on a dolly, yeah. it moves fairly predictably. If the camera is on a steady cam, it's smooth, but there's still a human body. And that human right. body is never, ever going to do that the exact same way twice. Mm -hmm. And none of the people acting in the field that are moving around are going to do anything the exact same way twice, which means that you're saying that you have to be continually adapting and moving every single frame to get everything to line up the right way. And of right. course, I mean, that's incredibly difficult. And they did it. The shot's amazing. Wow. Commodus enters. Cheers. Lucius is there. I think Lucilla is there. Basically, everyone comes to the Coliseum for these things. <laughs> I mean, this is like a whole big day. Like, we're, yeah. And they had like a program. Yeah, like, oh, we're going to have I'm this sure. battle in the morning, this animal in the evening, then an execution. It'll be good old fun. People would know like when to go get food, you know, so they wow. didn't miss like the good violence. Right. Or some people wanted to miss the good violence. We say we are about to die. Salute you. That is what you got to say. Maximus doesn't say it. No. Because the battle we're about to have is the war against Carthage. Yes. Where the Carthaginians lose. <laughs> yeah, supposedly. And we come in, we're the barbarian horde. Mm -hmm. And Maximus asks then, has anyone ever been in the army? Why did he ask this before? <laughs> it seems like this would be a useful piece of information. Whatever comes out of these gates, we've got a better chance of survival if we work together. Do you understand? We stay together, we survive. This is the moment that the general comes back. Yeah. He has been absent. Mm -hmm. And now we see the great, the, the, the leader, the thinker, the strategist. Right. Doors open and in come the chariots. Man, they make this chariot scary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a great scene. And it was a great scene. They got these big blades on the wheels, even bigger than the Ben Hur blades. <laughs> we got archers on the back of uh that are shooting out of these uh these crossbows. Yeah. And Maximus orders them into a formation. Um and the shields hold up against these bladed wheels. And then they move out as a chariot comes by and they knock over a chariot. <laughs> yeah. It's a really cool battle scene. Yeah. A uh, woman gets cut in half. Yeah. That is pretty brutal. A lot of female gladiators in this scene. Yeah. Which makes you think, did the Romans have female gladiators? Like female battle warriors? Like, I don't know. What is this Carthage story? Like, do you know about the Battle of Carthage? Uh, only a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I, I just wonder know. about it because I wonder if there were, you know. I don't know of warriors. any Roman female warrior, like in terms of yeah. the organized army. This is an interesting thing. So, Well, Ridley Scott, again, he doesn't, like what he kept <laughs> saying is like, well, they had to do something like this. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so he kept like, like there's a scene where the senators are having coffee. It's yeah, like, yeah. they must have had something like this. They have no evidence of this. Or it's like, well, they must have done, you know, they must have had a weapon kind of like this. I guess so. Like they must have had a Death Star. <laughs> they must have had a Death Star. Um, Everyone's got a Death yeah, Star. Yeah, like the rotating crossbow, that didn't exist. Oh. That's invented for the movie. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, because yeah, Ridley Scott said, I want something that's like it can fire multiple shots. And so they, it, and it probably fired about eight feet. Like it didn't really work that well. Yeah. Um, but they invented it for the movie. And then there's, after we've kind of knocked over a couple of chariots, man, Maximus runs up, mounts a horse, grabs a spear. Mm -hmm. Juba throws him a sword. Single column! Single column! Uh, Ru Russell Crowe really, really was into these horse stunts. He I'm loved, sure. great horse rider, really wanted to do them. They were really reluctant because 
it's dangerous. Yes, you know the, the, these kinds of these kinds of stunts in particular on on horseback are, are really hard to do, yeah. and your main actor gets hurt. Man, that's your movie. Mm -hmm. um, but it looks it looks great. Really good work on that. <laughs> I love. There's a, a cut to a reaction shot of uh, Joaquin Phoenix going woo woo. Yeah, woo, yeah. It's kind weird of mocking it. Yeah, it's a really strange moment. And then when the blood starts happening, he's like ah. Wow. Yeah. Like he's like bloodthirsty or whatever. It's a, it's he's a strange man. He's a like strange cat, dude. Um, All around. Which yeah. is why I think if this Joker film happens, he's gonna be an interesting, interesting Joker. Sure. I don't want that Joker film. <laughs> I'm just saying if it does. But he would be interesting, yeah. Yeah. And man, the barbarians seem to be winning. I love the line, my history is a little hazy. Shouldn't the barbarians lose the Battle of Carthage? Right. And now we're starting to wonder who is this guy? Who is the Spaniard? And Commodus says, I think I'll meet him. Russell Crowe's really thinking about throwing that spear at this moment. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. Um, the soldiers come out surrounding our guys. They have them all drop their weapons. Uh, the emperor wants to come speak with you. And here comes Commodus. And just as he's coming up, Maximus spots an arrowhead or a piece of an arrow in the mm -hmm. ground, kneels down and grabs it. And he would have killed him at yep. this moment. Yep. Except who comes up? But Lucius. Yeah. And he gets in the way. And right now, Commodus is being... Pretty nice to the Spaniard. Your fame is well-deserved, Spaniard. I don't think there's ever been a gladiator to match you. As for this young man, he insists you are Hector reborn. Was it Hercules? Why doesn't the hero reveal himself and tell us all your real name? You do have a name. My name is Gladiator. And he turns his back on the emperor and starts to walk away. Not the, not the first time he's walked away from Commodus. No, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, I mean, this is, you can't do this. Yeah. And he says, you can't, you know, turn around, face me. And that, this is a, this is a great moment in the yeah. film. Will you remove your helmet and tell me your name? Takes off the mask and says his full name. Full name? Yeah. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius. Commander of the armies of the North. General of the Felix Legions. Loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius. Father to a murdered son. Husband to a murdered wife. And I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. He's saying it right out there. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Now here's the thing. Basically. When he says, I will have my vengeance in this life or the next, mm -hmm. you're surrounded by thousands of people. Sure. I don't know that they can all hear you. What do they think he means? I don't think they can hear him, to be honest with you. That's the thing between him and, and Commodus. Well, all the soldiers can certainly hear him. Sure. Um, and of course, who's there but Quintus, Quintus his, right. old, his old guy. And the reaction shots, including Lucillus, is, they're just great. Yep. And, and at this moment, Commodus would probably kill him. Oh, yeah. Except for the mob. Yep. And they say, live. Mm -hmm. And they give a thumbs up. And Commodus puts out his thumb and hesitates for a while, and then he gives the thumbs up. Right. Because if you live by the mob, die by the mob. You can't cross them yep. if you want to use them. Mm -hmm. By the way, very interesting historical debate about whether or not thumbs up meant live or die. Oh. Because there, there is some speculation that thumbs up actually meant death. Because you were saying, yes, kill that guy. Oh, okay. Or no, don't kill that guy. I gave hand signals for all, you of, you, all of you playing the home game. <laughs> um, so he's gonna live. Commodus exits, the crowds cheers, and now instead of cheering Spaniard, now they cheer Maximus. Yeah. Commodus is not pleased. He is pissed. <laughs> this is not happy. And this feels familiar. Yeah. If they lie to me, they don't respect me. If they don't respect me, they can't love me. I am so intrigued by that line. <laughs> if they don't lie to me, if they lie to me, they can't respect me. If they don't respect me, they can't love me. Mm. Who the fuck, how do you fuck do you think love works? Well, or clearly respect? he has no concept of love because yeah. he's never experienced it. Yeah. He's never had it given to him. Yeah. So yeah. Or given it. Or given it. Well, Because they've never been taught it. I mean, this is the thing is like, for the most part, love is something you give. You can't demand that someone loves you. You can't ask someone to love you. You can ask someone. It doesn't mean they can say. Doesn't mean they'll say yes. Well, it doesn't usually help. Yeah, no. I problem. mean, like you know, most of the time, if you're asking someone to love, yeah. you're to love you, you're already in deep shit. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is something we obviously talked a lot about in Citizen Kane. Yes. But but, but like 
this respect, love, they have to love me thing and demanding love of people. Well, yeah. that ain't, that's not how it's going to work. No, 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 no. You know, um, I still don't feel sorry for the guy. No. Um, he's Too a horrible creepy. person. I love the line, it vexes me. <laughs> terribly vexed. It vexes me. I'm terribly vexed. And then he asked Lucilla, what did you feel when you saw him? Yeah. And her reply is, I felt nothing. He wounded you deeply, didn't he? No more than I wounded him. It, it does make me wonder exactly what their relationship is. Yeah, I think he, you know, I think Maximus has been around for a long time and had a thing with Lucilla and probably knew about his thing, uh, uh, Commodus's thing for Lucilla. And so in the end, though, he couldn't uh, be her husband because he was, didn't have any station. He was just a soldier. Right. So, well, and the sense we have is that he didn't, and does not love her not the, the same way, way he did the, this woman in Spain. She's right. the, she's the one. Yes, you know, like his feelings about her. Are and, and the other thing too, man, Maximus doesn't want to be in this Roman shit. No shit. He doesn't. When he talks about home and that smile, he he cares about being a good general yep. and leading his men. And he cares about his men, yep. and he wants to be home in this farm and away from all these people. Yep. And you know what? Looking at this, I don't blame him. Mm -hmm. and, and and the scene ends with Lucilla and Commodus with her just asking him, what will you do? And, and this is just, again, for screenwriters out there, ending a scene with a question is a great thing to do. Hmm. Is that don't answer the question because now we have tension. Yeah. Like, what will he do? And now we're thinking about what will he do? And that's keeping our uh, interest in the movie high. If Commodus says, I'm going to do this and this and this, you go, oh, okay. And you're right. kind of done with the scene. Any scene with a question is great. That's good. Um, uh, we're back in the sort of, not jail exactly, but where they keep the gladiators mm -hmm. and in comes Lucilla. Um, and this scene, by the way, is a complete rewrite. So they shot the scene once and then they reshot it completely differently. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a really, really good scene. When it's Shades of the Braveheart scene too, brother, this is another oh, companion yeah. companion epic when he's tied up and she, the French sure. queen comes to see him sure. and blah, 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 and begs him not to you know, to, to recant. Well, and what's so great about the scene too, is that Maximus doesn't know if he can trust her. Right. You know, and my feeling is the first time I saw the movie, I didn't know what, if I could trust her. And he's angry at her, man. He, oh yeah. He says, you knew, you fucking knew. And you, yeah. you, you let them do it to my wife and my child. And did she know? That's I kind of think question. she did. I think she did too. Um, or I might've heard it. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, th but what was she going to do? I have been living in a prison of fear since that day. To be unable to mourn your father for fear of your brother. To live in terror every moment of every day because your son is heir to the throne. And Maximus says, my son was innocent. And her response is, so is mine. Yeah. That's, a, that's really good. Don't you understand? Today I saw a slave become more powerful than the emperor of Rome. The gods have spared me. I am at their mercy. With the power only to amuse a mob. That is power. The mob is Rome, and while Commodus controls them, he controls everything. And, and we see this, and I don't want to get back into the politics again, yeah. but we see this in our own political life, which is that one moment, one idea, and it changes the political dynamics. Yep. That something becomes symbolic of something, and then you cannot deal with that, yeah. you know, because it has become, just the symbol has become too powerful. Yep. And then this idea has created of like the key to standing up to the emperor, to, to, to get rid of tyranny, is this gladiator, this yeah. guy. Yeah. And she wants him to be part of this. And he's like, I may die in this cell tonight or in the arena tomorrow. I am a slave. What possible difference can I make? And she says, too, I'll help you. You know, let me help you. And he says, you can help me. Forget you ever knew me and never come here again. Yeah. And then he calls the guard and says, God, the lady has finished with me. Because Maximus has no plan to be it. He doesn't need to be a hero for Rome. Yeah. He wants his revenge. Right. And that's it. We're sitting down with the gladiators, and this is where, what's his name again, the big guy? Rolf Muller. Rolf Muller yeah. asks, how many victories did you have in Germania? And what's he asking here? Well, he's, uh, well, I mean, he basically asked him, did you subjugate my people? Did you cause me to become a slave because you were a general leading these Romans against my people? And I think the answer is clearly yes. Yes. And I think everyone knows the answer is mm -hmm. yes. And then what's the mo next moment? Someone brings some food for Maximus. Yeah. And what does Rolf do? He tastes it for it, him. Yep. And what does he do next? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
He fake chokes, which is great. I love the fake choke. Yeah. <laughs> What's funny, I think Rolf said, I don't know that I can pull off this kind of joke. Like, if <laughs> oh, that's really? not in my range oh, as wow. an actor, he does it great. It's he hilarious. Did. Yeah. Um, Germans can be quite funny if you let them. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to all the German cinephiles out there. <laughs> I mean, you know, there are not a lot of German comics, so I'm just saying. And at the end of the scene, they say, you have a great name. Yeah. They must kill your name before they kill you. Man, they sure got their finger on the pulse with that line. Yeah, we're at the Colosseum, and Gracchus is there, mm -hmm. and he see, and we're slowly understanding that he is the political counterpoint to Commodus. Yes, and a, and a curmudgeonly, yeah. like a, gr a grumpy political counterpoint, constantly questioning and not sure if he should be involved in this whole situation. And of course, Commodus arrives, and he is throwing bread to the people. Literally, this is bread and circuses, uh, which is a real thing that they did to yeah. try to sway the crowd. By the way, one of the things Commodus did was in addition to throwing bread, he would occasionally throw among the bread live snakes just to freak them out because he thought that was funny. Oh my God. Yeah, the real Commodus, I do think, was a piece of work. I think you're right. He wasn't this guy. Right. But he wasn't such a nice guy. And one thing we see is that uh, Cicero's in the crowd, um, and now it's time to introduce the only undefeated champion in Roman history, <laughs> Tigris of Gaul. <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> That's very well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and he comes in a chariot. He's got a great mask. He's got a great look. This is a big guy. Yeah. And you said, which? Do you remember which guy? It is oh, Conan? oh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, he the two. If you watch Conan the Barbarian, he's one of the two two bad guys. The two bad guys, and he is he's been a friend of Arnold's for a long time. If you see Running Man, he's the security guard. Oh, so it's um yes, and I of course I don't. Have yeah, to yeah, mean, yeah. I know who you mean. Yeah, and he gets he's been in a number of things. Uh, he's an interesting cat. Oh uh, shoot, I'm sorry, I can't come up with it. Right off the bat, I know it's here. Sven Oli Thorson. Sven Oli Thorson. Yeah, yes. he, he was yes. a bodybuilder, powerlifter, karate, black black belt karate. But he uh, did a lot of the stunts. Like he did a lot of mm. the all the things that you see there: Gladiator, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Eraser, Collateral, even Collateral. And oh. so he's he's been a, around for a while coordinating stuff. So yeah. it's it was so great to see him. Ma Maximus has a has a last conversation. Has another conversation with all, with Proximo. I love this conversation. This is such yeah. a great because in front of all the gladiators. Yeah. Marcus Aurelius had a dream that was Rome, Proximo. This is not it. This is not it. Marcus Aurelius is dead, Maximus. We mortals are but shadows and dust. Shadows and dust, Maximus. This is an important line, shadows and dust, because we're going to come back to this in a little while. It's my favorite line of the film. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Because it's true. Certainly true. Maximus enters the arena to cheers and roses. They embrace him like he's one of their own. The mob is fickle, brother. He'll be forgotten in a month. She says that just to calm him down, but she doesn't believe it. Right. She's just saying it just to make him not and get crazy. And his response is sooner, sooner than later. It's been arranged. Yeah. Um, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> Maximus drives his sword in the ground. Again, we get the dirt on the hands. Yeah. And as just as just as they start to get ready to fight, uh, and Tigris uh, is kicks sand in uh, Maximus's face. Mm -hmm. Not fair. No. Totally not fair. Nope. And then these guys are coming in and they're pulling up chains. And just as there's this great kind of flurry of blows, this is a really, really well choreographed it is. Uh, fight scene. Trap door opens up and out comes a tiger. Tiger! <laughs> it scared the crap out of me the no, first time I saw no it. No shit! Because you're like, how close... Is this, and how many of those tigers are there going to be? My God. It is. So this tiger sequence. So first of all, we should be clear. These are not fake tigers. These are real tigers. These are real tigers. There is some fakery within the sequence. Yes. But these are real tigers. And the thing about, this is a crazy scene. Yeah. This is crazy dangerous. Because the thing about tigers, you cannot train tigers. You can adapt tigers to doing the things you want them to do. But tigers in the end, this is what one of the trainers said. Tigers are only doing what they want to do. And so you can get them to want to do the thing you want them to do. But that's only because they want to do that at the moment. You can't tell them what to do. Right. And tigers are so fat. Like, have you ever seen, like, your house cat, you know, mm -hmm. who suddenly darts at something and you see how really super fast they are? You take that and make it a 1,000-pound animal, but still that fast. Mm -hmm. Like, they are ridiculously fast and powerful. And they could take an arm off or a hand off or your, slice your body open in a second. Yep. And they have guys holding these things on chains and trying to get them as close to the guys who are fighting as possible, but still being safe. Insanity. And yeah, we're doing some trickery with lenses. So what looks like, you know, eight inches away is really more like 
four feet away, but four feet away is still really close with a fucking tiger. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is a crazy sequence. Never get out of the goddamn boat. Yeah, man. never get out of the boat. <laughs> Just going to get some mangoes, man. <laughs> fucking mangoes, man. Listen, was, that, that whole sequence is so insane and it's scary. And you're right. And if you look at the Siegfried and Roy stuff, like what happened to him, yeah. Chris Rock has a great bit where he says, that tiger didn't go crazy. That tiger went tiger. That's yeah. what it is. And that's true. Absolutely. It's yeah. amazing the tiger didn't do it before. Yeah. Tigers are, yeah. And, and so, and the thing is what I think about is like I've done fight choreography and I've done back in my youth doing stage combat mm -hmm. stuff and love doing that stuff. And you think about how much time you'd spend trying to get the fight up to full speed and to do it where you're really going at the person and and yet nobody's getting hurt and how thin the margins for error are on. Right. And now you're going to do this and do a really intense, fast speed, you know, with metal weapons fight scene. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, there's fucking Tiger <laughs> <laughs> right behind you. Yeah. And so not only do you have to get your distancing and steps exactly right, but if you step a one step wrong or you slip and fall, again, fucking Tiger. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. motiv it motivates you to get it right. That's for sure. Damn right, you better get this thing right. <laughs> and they so they shot it over three weeks, and and very three weeks, three weeks. Fuck all that. And and very quickly they go like, oh, we're not gonna, we can't make all this work. And so again, you have that editor with who's editing visual v digitally every night, talking to the VFX guys, talking to the fight choreographers, talking to the tiger trainers, and going. I need a shot of a tiger lunging in this way or at this angle. Mm. And they're getting that and they're blue screening and compositing and building. So it's real tigers, yeah. but it's built in all these little pieces and a lot of shots that are composited together to get the story told. I mean, it's really super complicated in addition to being super dangerous. And then there's the one shot where the tiger does attack Russell Crowe on the back. So that is the tiger trainer. That is a real tiger jumping on his back. And he's got, you know, essentially like, you know, a, a leg of, pork or something that the tiger is reaching as soon as the tiger is done eating the pork or whatever meat he's holding off from you got to get the tiger off of him yeah because he's next yep you know i have some scary <laughs> some scary stuff man um it is a great great fight scene too. yeah though yeah like even if you didn't have the tigers i think it's a really well choreographed fight scene yep. and it ends with you know an axe going through the you know the bad guy's foot <laughs> this guy goes down and Maximus is standing over him. Oh, and Maximus, I should say, Maximus also kills one of the tigers. Yes. Um, and then he's standing over our, our, our bad guy, our undefeated guy at the end, and he's got his ax up in the air, and the crowd yells to kill him. We get a thumbs down. Commodus says thumbs down. Maximus raises up the ax, about to kill him, throws the ax away. Yeah. And then almost immediately, which I think is a little cheesy, you're Maximus the Merciful. And I was like, oh, yeah. come on, calm it down, calm it down. <laughs> the mob the mob doesn't change that quick. Like, you wanted the guy dead. Yeah. I think we're, we, he might be merciful, but we're pretty clear you're a bunch of assholes. Yes, <laughs> right, you bloodthirsty bastard. <laughs> you loved this guy just a minute ago. <laughs> he was the world champion. That's right. Um, and then we get Commodus and Maximus again. What am I going to do with you? You simply won't die. <laughs> and Maximus is no bullshit now. I have yeah. one more life to take. I have only one more life to take, and it is done. Take it now. And and what he says to him to try, and this happens, what he says to him to try to get him to react, to try to get him to attack the emperor so that they can, he, they can kill him. They tell me your son squealed like a girl when they nailed him to the cross. And your wife moaned like a whore when they ravaged her, again, and again, and again. And man, Russell has a great reaction, and Maximus's line is so good, he says, Time for honoring yourself will soon be at an end. Highness. And it's a fucking great line. And he walks out on him again. I gotta remember that line. And he walks out on him again, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that line could come in handy at, the next, at in. the next Schmodown. There's a lot of smack talk in the Schmodown. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> we should we by the way, we found a lot of sick burns. There was uh oh. when, we, when we did uh uh um uh, uh Judgment in Nuremberg, yes. there's Burt Lancaster. What's his character's name? Uh Rolf. What is that? It's not Herr Rolf is uh Maximilian Schultz. Oh, anyway, oh anyway, because he had sick burns. Yes. Auda Abu Dai has sick burns. He has sick burns all over the place. And now Maximus, man. Yeah. You know, and as he's leaving the Coliseum, Cicero has mm -hmm. reappeared, is trying to get his attention, hands him off something, says where he's 
camped. Yeah. And he says, tell them your general lives. And he opens the little bag that Cicero, and he sees that it's the little statue. It's the little um, worship thing of his family yep. that he had that he had prayed to. Um, and we get another scene with Jubo as he's kind of praying to the statue. And, and he says, can they hear you? Oh, yes. What do you say to them? To my boy. I tell him I will see him again soon. To keep his heels down when he's riding his horse. To my wife. That is not your business. <laughs> That's a great line. Great. It's really great. <laughs> Commodus continues to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. This is not a happy dude. Mm -mm. Um, it's a very unhappy guy. It's funny that Marcus Aurelius quote is your anger is hurting you more than the cause of your anger or whatever the quote, man, that really applies to apparently his son. Yeah. Because now they think they're calling him Maximus the merciful. Um, and that makes me unmerciful. Mm. And we've got a Senator and this, this Senator is kind of on the Commodus size. And he says, every day he lives, they grow bolder, kill him. He's like, I can't kill him. It'll make a martyr of him. Right. We get into this thing about the, the the sea snake that lets its enemies come to him. Let him take little bites out of you to get the enemies closer. Mm -hmm. Starting to figure out what our strategy is going to be. Um, Cicero's back um, and tells Maximus that the men are fed and bored. And there's some fool from Roman command. And, and Maximus asks, how soon they, can they be ready to fight? For you, tomorrow. And, and I love this. I'm like, oh, this movie is going to be... We're going to siege Rome. Like, this yeah. is going to be this huge, you know, he's going to go back to being the general. And Cicero runs out and finds a palanquin, and the palanquin has uh, Lucilla on. Mm -hmm. and he's trying to get her attention. They're ignoring, ignoring, ignoring. And finally, he says, I serve your father. I serve Maximus. I serve him still. And now yeah. she'll talk to him. Yeah. And he says, okay, Maximus is in. He'll meet with this politician. Right. We've got all of, we've got Proximo and Maximus meeting Lucilla and in comes Gracchus, uh, Derek Jacobi, mm -hmm. uh, and says like the senators are with him. Um, and basically it's get me out of Rome and my army is there and their loyalty lies with me. This is madness. No Roman army has entered the capital in a hundred years. Gracchus, I will not trade one dictatorship for another. The last army to enter Rome was Caesar's. Right. Julius Caesar's. Right. Um, do you know the origin of the word dictator? No. This is really interesting, I think. Dictator was an elected position. Mm. So this is what happened. Is there were So Rome was a republic, right? Mm -hmm. They're ruled by a senate. We don't want to have a king or anything like that. And, but they realized that the problem with a republic is it moves really slow. It doesn't. It's not decisive. And so what they did a few times in history was they said, you know what? We need somebody to take over because like the, the, some huge army is coming for us, like Carthage, like yeah. Hannibal or something like that. It's like, we need a, we need someone to take over. So we're going to elect a dictator for three years and then they're going to go off and fight the big, they're in charge for these three years. And then after three years, they're going to hand power back to the Senate. Yeah. And one of the rules of Rome was that the city of Rome was sacrosanct. There could never be an army in the city of Rome. And so... Uh, I think Pompey is one of the people that was elected dictator. There are a couple of other guys in Roman history. Of course, Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. They said, We're, you're going to be dictator for three years. And he takes off his army, and he's obviously a great general. And then Caesar, the, the border of Rome is the Rubicon. That's the, the, right. the, the, the river. And so Caesar crosses the Rubicon with the army, brings the army into Rome. Mm -hmm. And there is the question. Of course, Caesar never became emperor. Julius Caesar never became right. emperor. There is the question of whether or not is he going to give back the dictatorship and let the Senate rule again, or is he not? And, and of course, Brutus and Cassius and those guys thought that he was not. And mm -hmm. so they stab him, you know, on, on the Ides of March. Right. Which was the day before yesterday, by the way. Oh. Now you know when we recorded this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm just sort of fascinated. But now today, the meaning of dictator is completely different. Right. Well, he changed the meaning, didn't he? By, being, by doing what he did, he changed right. the meaning. Yeah. That's right. Um, Julius Caesar is a fascinating, you know, one of those great, yes. fascinating geniuses and in some ways is a truly great and good man, and yeah. in some ways one of the great scourges and evil people, well, yeah. depending on how you look at it. And um, if you have never seen the TV show Rome, I can't I recommend never it enough. Had. I can't re recommend it enough, because Caesar is all about that time right at the beginning, and right. then what happens afterwards. Yeah. yeah. 
And this is the big question is that, is Maximus going to give back the power? And now we know Maximus pretty well. He doesn't want to have any of the power. Right. We know he's going to give it back. Right. And the constant questioning from Gracchus, he answers everything correctly. You know, yeah. he says, no, I, I, I'm going to give it away because I don't want anything to do with this shit. Right. And, and Gracchus's response is, Marcus Aurelius trusted you. His daughter trusted you. I will trust you. Yeah. Two days and I will buy your freedom. But the real thing is, you stay alive or I'll be dead. Yeah. I like that a lot. And now we're back with Oliver Reed because he's the he's the key to this, is that it, for the Gracchus to buy his freedom, Oliver Reed has to sell it. He has to make all of this stuff work. Yeah. And 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 Maximus asks him, you know, do you remember what it was to have trust? And and, and he's and Maximus is saying, I'm gonna go kill Commodus. And Proximo's like, why would I want that? Why would I want that? He makes me rich. Oh, I I know that you are a man of your word, General. I know that you would die for honor. You would die for Rome. You would die for the memory of your ancestors. But I, on the other hand, I'm an entertainer. And Maximus says he killed the man who set you free. That line is added later. Oh, wow. Because this is what we're going to get into, is that Oliver Reed dies with three weeks left in the production. Yeah. And what we're going to talk about is what they had to do in order to make all of this work. Oh. Uh, because they had to completely rewrite the character. Wow. Yeah. So we're going to get into, this is where we're kind of getting there now. Okay. Unfortunately, none of this plan is going to work because the Centurions are coming to take Gracchus away. Um, yeah. Uh, Commodus finds Lucilla and says, where have you been? And he's asking some questions about Gracchus. Um, and he says, the Senate must be bled and very soon. And her response is, not tonight. Right. And and he gives her a creepy, dark look. Mm -hmm. um, and she realizes she's going to have to do more. And she comes to him and he yeah. leans on her. And then he moves in closer and he mm. grabs her. And now she lies down. Yeah. And he touches her lips and he puts her fingers in his mouth. And oh. it's some creepy, horrible stuff. Yep. You know, I love you. Man, she's got to walk a line here that mm -hmm. is so scary and upsetting and horrible. And many women have had to walk this line yeah. in certain times in their lives, which is why this this uh, scene is so uh, unsettling, man. It, it really, really is. Yeah. She goes back to Maximus. Um, the other gladiators are sent out, and and it's like, no, you got to get out tonight. Um, and she's she's risking it all now. Mm -hmm. She's like saying, okay, we got to make this happen right now. And he says, you risk too much. And she says, I have much to pay for. You have nothing to pay for. You love your son. You're strong for him. And her response is great. I am tired of being strong. That's a lot. She wants to do something about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then finally she says, I felt alone in my life except with you. And then they kiss. Mm -hmm. And this is... You know, this is a really lovely romantic moment. Mm -hmm. Lucius is practicing his sword work with some, you know, trainers, I guess. Yeah. And Commodus sees him. Ugh. And he says, oh, you're being a legionnaire. He's like, oh, I'm not a legionnaire. I'm a gladiator. Mm. A gladiator? Gladiators only fight in the games. Would you rather be a great Roman warrior like Julius Caesar? I'm Maximus, the savior of Rome. It's like, dude, <laughs> wrong thing to say. <laughs> And Lucilla arrives looking for Lucius and she finds Commodus telling Lucius the story of Cleopatra and how she killed herself by the bite of an ass. Asp, not an ass. Asp is a hard snake to say. Mm -hmm. and, he, and Commodus says, ladies do strange things in the name of love. And Lucius says, I think it's silly. So do I. So do I. Uh, and this is when Lucilla overhears this last bit. Um, and, you know, of course, we know he's talking about yeah, her. Yeah. And it is a creepy, horrible scene. And then he tells the story of Claudius. He was betrayed by those closest to him. By his own blood. And Lucilla, to listen to this. And he's, she's holding her son yeah. while he's saying these terrible things. And he talks as in the voice of Claudius, but really to Lucilla. Tell me. What you've been doing, busy little bee. Or I shall strike down those dearest to you. You shall watch as I bathe in their blood. This is a great threat. Oh, scene. yeah. This is a fantastic, genuinely scary, 
you know? Mm -hmm. And this is again, again on the screenwriting thing of like, if you had him just say, tell me what I want to know or I'm going to kill your son, yeah. this scene would not be as good. No. Doing it in subtext. And what's cr crazy too is at first, Lucilla knows what's going on right away, but then you see it start to dawn on Lucius what's going on. And that is really scary. Yep. A child's fear is always more powerful than yeah. an adult's fear because uh, they're discovering it for the first time, yeah. what that fear, what that feeling is. Yeah. And as this is happening, um, the soldiers start coming into where the, where the gladiators are. Mm -hmm. Maximus is gathering his stuff. Proximo comes to open the gates uh, and gives Maximus the key. And there's this scene through the gates. Uh, and, and at this point, when they filmed this, Oliver Reed had already died. Wow. Yeah. So, so, and this is what happened. So he died on May 2nd, 1999. Mm -hmm. There are about three weeks left in production. And of course, the first thing that happens is just shock, yeah, of course. just total shock. And he had become really close and they had all, you know, his performance was so sure. incredible. It's so much history there. And the second thought, because in the end, this is a practical business right. where they go, oh shit, what are we going to do? Right. And the, the, for, the first thing you think to do is that you file an insurance claim. So all these, all these movies have big insurance. Mm -hmm. And what would happen if they filed the insurance claim is that the insurance would have to pay for reshooting whatever they had to reshoot. And they said this would probably be $25 million or something because they would have to go back to Morocco and all of those sets have been torn down. Yeah. So they had to rebuild all the sets, cast somebody else, reshoot all that stuff in Morocco. And these are, you know, Oliver Reed is in big scenes. Yeah. So he's in scenes where like he's in the background of a big gladiatorial flight. Yeah. So you have to restage some of that stuff and you could cut around it to some degree. And they and so that's the first thing they're like, oh my God, that would be incredibly hard. And then they ask the question, Ridley Scott, the three writers, the special effects guy and the editor, can we make this work? Yeah. And one thing to keep in mind is that the final moment in the movie was written to be Oliver Reed. Proximo burying the gladiator sword in the floor of the arena. Oh, He was supposed to survive. He wasn't supposed to die. Wow. And they go, okay, what are we going to do? And they start, so they take every single bit of footage that they have of Oliver Reed and the editor and the writers are going, what can we make out of this? And so for instance, they go back through and they see, he says this word freedom in one of his speeches. Right. And they say, oh, that's a good word. Let's take that. And so they take him saying the word freedom and he, and he put, they put it, I think in this scene where he's handing, giving the keys to, um, uh, Max to, to Maximus yeah. and they edit it in, but he had different facial hair there. So that the computer guy has to take away the other facial hair because he had had like a full beard and now he only has the goatee. Right. So they take that and they're doing an over shoulder shot. And then it's actually Russell Crowe who says, shouldn't I say something to him in this last moment? Yeah. And the line, are you in danger of becoming a good man? That was Russell Crowe's idea on the set. It seems you've won your freedom. Proxima, are you in danger of becoming a good man? And all of this is being shot with a double. So anytime, like in when he's handing off the keys and when he gets killed, that's actually a body double, mm. um, different hands for the body double. And sometimes they're actually placing Oliver Reed's actual head on a body double as he walks through so they can get one forward looking shot. Right. And then the big one in the final moment when he's killed, when he's stabbed with all this, we cut to his face and he says, shadows and dust. Well, that came from when he said it in the other scene right. is that they had done take and he said it in a loud voice and then they did take two, take three, take four. And then one time they let the camera was rolling. And after he said it big, he said it to himself, shadows and dust. Mm. Huh. And that little thing, because Ridley Scott left, let the camera roll. And this is why I always tell directors, let it roll a little bit longer. Yeah. That is what they took and they recolored it, made it nighttime, changed the facial hair. And they used that what? to be the line of the final moment. Wow. That is nothing. Wow. I mean, that's just like amazing putting together the puzzle. Right. And these moments are great. And they had a body double from behind. Yep. Killing body himself. Double, yeah. Get yeah. killed. Yep. Yeah. Rolf gets killed with arrows and Maximus uh, gets out. He hears a horse and he sees Cicero on a horse mm. who tries to warn him away. He gets hit with arrows and hung. Yeah. That is brutal death for Cicero and Maximus is surrounded. Yeah. And it doesn't look very good for us. It's dawn in Rome. Commodus looks out at Rome and he realizes it's done. He's won. And now he's got this decision. This, uh, decision. Well, what, I, what do I do with Lucilla and her, and her kid? Mm. And at first you don't know that she's in the room. <laughs> but That's she, true, man. Yeah. And he, then he's speaking not to her, but he says, Lucius will stay with me now. 
and of his mother, so much as looks at him in a manner that displeases me, he will die. If she decides to be noble and takes her own life, he will die. And that's when she see that, sees that she's there. Mm -hmm. This is just awful. And this great face acting by Connie Nielsen, just taking this yeah. all in and reacting to it in a way that's so horrific and overwhelming because she didn't think the cage could get any smaller. Yeah. And then exactly. the cage gets smaller. I love the way you said that. Yeah. yeah. And he says, you will love me as I love you. So regardless of what their past relationship has been, we got a pretty good idea of what their future mm -hmm. has been. And he ends it with, Am I not merciful? It's creepy. It's a good bad guy. How am I supposed to feel sympathy for this motherfucker? No, I, that's why I keep going I like, really? 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 Yeah. Um, well, I mean, this is the thing. Directors are humans, and sometimes we can be really wrong about some shit. I mean, yeah. Um, we're back at the Col Coliseum. Everyone's still cheering Maximus. Uh, he's chained up. Jubo, fortunately, is still alive. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got him. Gracchus is there. Commodus arrives. He has a scene with Maximus. And his speech here is great. Yeah. They call for you. The general who became a slave. The slave who became a gladiator. The gladiator who defied an emperor. Striking story. Now that people want to know how the story ends, only a famous death will do. And what could be more glorious than to challenge the emperor himself in the great arena? And this is, of course, what we what Maximus wants. Yeah. And he's like, "You'd fight me?" And he goes, "Why not? Do you think I'm afraid?" I think you have been afraid all your life. Boom! Yeah. It is such a burn. Yeah. It's the sickest burn yet. Because <laughs> he says that to him. Because that that completely, all this yep. fake pomp and circumstance and fake strength he's been showing by intimidating all these people, Maximus completely undercuts the in, all four pillars of the construction of who he is as a person by saying, I think you've been afraid your entire life life and i love the next moment too where he says you know i had this friend are you a man who once said death smiles at us all all a man can do is smile back i wonder did your friend smile at his own death you must know he was your father <laughs> which is saying like See? you were there at his death yeah you were the only person who saw how he meet, met his death yep but actually he couldn't see if he was smiling because he was smothering against his chest but that's not the point <laughs> um the point is he's saying he killed and now we're back to this idea of brothers because they both love the same man as a father mm -hmm. you loved my father i know but so did i that makes us brothers doesn't it Smile for me now, brother. And then Commodus stabs him. <laughs> Here's the deal. Yeah. If I had watched a dude fight off tigers and kill a huge guy and fight off chariots, it's the, I wouldn't be so sure that one stab is going to do it. But if you were that smart, you wouldn't be doing half the shit he does in this movie. Fair. That's the thing. Fair. He, he is... It's his hubris. You're absolutely right. Right? Uh, yeah, Some people of in power think they can't be touched through their hubris and make colossal mistakes thinking they can't be touched, and then they are taken down. Well, and this, of course, goes back to your earlier point, which is how much are the guys that are training him taking it easy on him yeah. when he's practicing? Because, And this is the thing. Uh, I call this, by the way, sensei mystique, which is that what it is is that if you are teaching the class is that people expect you to do well. Yes. And they expect your shit to work. And that makes it much more likely that your shit wor will work. And particularly when you're demonstrating, like if I'm demonstrating an Aikido technique, mm -hmm. well, the job of my uke to some degree is to make it a good demonstration so that the people can see that it works. Right. His job is not to fully challenge me at every single moment. Right. Um, and what can happen if he, if he really never challenges me at all is that I go, man, I'm great. 
And then I want to go try that stuff out with someone who doesn't know the rules <laughs> right. and that shit, it, it's not going to work. No. Um, and so part of what you have to do if you're, and I'm not claiming to be any kind of great martial artist at all, that, right, right. but, but one of the things you have to do is go like, no, no, we got to, we got to reel this up a little bit. Don't let me get away with stuff. Mm -hmm. Does Commodus seem like a guy that told his people training with him not to let him get away with stuff? Mm -hmm. That does not seem like a thing that he would do. <laughs> um, but he thinks he's got the perfect plan. Stabs him, gets the armor on. We go out into the arena. This crowd has got to know that Maximus is not looking good. Right. Um, and yet, what does he do? He kneels down, grabs some dirt from the ground. Yeah, it's his ritual. Do you think that you watching this movie the first time had any sense at all that Maximus wasn't going to win? No, because he's the hero. Yeah. I, and it's really rare when they don't let the hero win in the final battle. It's well, really rare. Particularly in this kind of a movie. Yes. It's, this is not the kind of movie where you're going to have, it doesn't seem to me. You'd be such a letdown yeah. that if he was able to cripple him before the battle, yeah. therefore, and then won the battle, it would be terrible. And just to make this a little worse, Quintus doesn't give him the sword. He throws it away. It's yeah. like, no, you go get it. And we get into this battle, and man, as soon it's like as soon as we're going, Maximus is at him. Yeah. I wonder at what point Commodus wants to go like, hey, hold on. <laughs> this was not a good idea. Probably immediately afterwards. Yeah. Um, and then he, he gets disarmed. He calls for a sword. Give me another sword. Quintus, sword! Give me your sword! And Quintus doesn't do it. Right. Yeah. I don't think it quite makes him heroic. Who, Quintus? Quintus. No. I mean, it's good that he didn't. He tells all his guys, sheath your sword, don't yeah. help him. He's a, he's a survivalist. Yeah. And in this moment, Maximus drops his sword. Mm -hmm. And he goes into, we go back into this dream, this connection to the world of his home and his son and his daughter. And the emperor sees there's this moment of weakness and he draws a knife that he has yeah. at his sleeve or something. And Maximus snaps out, defends with elbows and punches and just wipes the floor with the knife. And then we get to this slow stab as he kills the emperor. And the slapping is as a child would slap. Yeah. Right? He's reverting back to a desperation as a child. Like, he goes back to being a child. Who he is? Essentially a man-child. But he goes back to that. It, it's not punches. It yeah. slaps. Yep. And that lets you know that this is an infantile person. Yeah. And so embracing his death. And Maximus kills the emperor. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. In the neck. Yeah. A look in his face. Yeah, and there's a long, stunned silence, as there, as there would yeah, be yeah. at a crowd. And then Max staggers. And I love the way this is edited, that he sees in front of him his home. Yeah. And he reaches out for the door, and he goes to push it open. And then he has this last moment where he gives his last orders. Quintus, free my men. Senator Gracchus is to be reinstated. There was a dream that was Rome. It shall be realized. These are the wishes of Marcus Aurelius. And then you see the hands through the wheat. Yes. And then he falls. Just as Lucilla runs up. And Maximus tells her that Lucius is safe. And after a long pause, Lucilla, tears in her eyes, looks down at Maximus and says, go to them. And then he dies. And again, we have that same shot of him floating over the ground. And he sees his wife and son. Mm -hmm. He walks towards his family. Lucilla closes his eyes. The gladiators and Gracchus gather around him. And Lucilla makes a speech. It's Rome worth one good man's life. We believed it once. Make us believe it again. was a soldier of Rome. Honor him. Who will help me carry him? And of course, everyone does. Yes. Yeah. And they carry him out. It's a West Side Story moment. Totally. Right? Totally. Totally that. And they carry Tony out. Yeah. And then we have this last moment with Jubo, and his hands are in the dirt, and he buries the statues and says, Now we are free. We'll see you again. But not yet. Not yet. 
Yeah, I love that. It's such a great, and I, you know, Steve, you don't want to say someone died as a happy accident, but I think he was the right choice. I don't, I think it wouldn't have worked if it was Oliver Reed doing it. I think having Jubo do it works so much more powerfully because they had developed such a friendship through the, through the movie as characters. Do you know what I'm saying? So there was connection. So it kind of wraps the whole thing up in a nice bow to have him be the one that buries uh, the, the, uh, the figures and says, I will see you. Not yet. Not yet. I totally agree. I couldn't agree more. I think it's such a nice moment, and I I love the character Jubo, and yeah. and and I care about him in a different way that I care about Proximo. Yeah, I like Proximo, sure. it, but I actually think the movie works better the yeah. way that they ended up doing it. Mm -hmm. Even though, of course, no one would have wanted it to go that way. And who knows if they would have still ended up? They would have ended it anyway that way because they were rewriting all the time. So all the time, they certainly could have ended it with Jobu anyway. Yeah, in Jobu. And, and and by the way, I have more emotional investment with the object that is those little idols mm -hmm. than I do with the object that was the sword, which right. is what Proxima would have buried. Right. Actually, it's a cool sword, but I didn't, I wasn't connected to it in the same way. The objects are love. The sword is battle war. Great. Yes, it is, exactly. Yeah, it's right. difference. So uh, we don't have to tell you that the movie was a big hit. It did succeed with women, which was the big surprise. Yeah. And, uh, and it was one that built over time. Like the first week it did pretty well, next week better, next week better. And of course, when it comes award seasons, first of all, we have to take a moment to remember the Golden Globe drunk, I won't oh. say that she's drunk, possibly drunk Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, yeah. Who didn't quite know how to win the card and then finally says, when it wins, Gladiator. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's particularly weird thinking about now because I'm like, oh, she was in the, the last giant epic. Right. As Cleopatra, Cleopatra in 63. Right. Um, and then we get to the Oscars, and this is one of those rare movies where it didn't win Best Director. Soderbergh wins for Traffic. Yeah, but which is uh, ridiculous. Yeah, I I I'm, I like Traffic. It's a good yeah, movie. Sure. it's a nice movie. It doesn't hold up. Yeah, um, Gladiator holds up. I and, and well, I think what again you go to like what did Ridley Scott have to do to make this movie work? Right. It's pretty impressive. So he doesn't win, but the movie does win. Right. Best Pictures. Uh, Russell Crowe wins Best Actor. Mm -hmm. It wins also for costume, sound mixing, and visual effects. So it's obviously totally deserved. Yeah. And the next day, Ridley Scott is on a plane to go back to Morocco to shoot Black Hawk Down. <laughs> Which is a great film as well. It's another good film. Yeah. yeah. He makes two really good ones in a row. It's, and it's one of these rare films, Steve, that was a popular hit that won Best Picture. It is a yeah. monster popular hit, and it wins Best Picture. It's really rare when today. that happens. Yes, it didn't today. used to be I'm rare. Sorry, today, Back yes. in the day, it didn't wasn't rare, but now right. it is. Well, I think this is clearly, as we saw with the last Oscars, this is clearly something that's kind of wrong with Hollywood now, yeah. which is that there's this weird split between popular films and Oscar-winning films. Right. I mean, like the, we had the lowest-rated Oscars of all time, mm -hmm. I think, this last year. And yes, we did. This was. is part of the reason. There are other reasons, too. Yeah, I agree. I think it is a big reason why. I think it, and, and also because the, it seemed like these uh, awards were already done, and it wasn't. there was no drama. And uh, people like to watch for drama. It's a TV show. People like to watch for drama. Even if it's yeah. non-scripted, they still like to watch for drama. And there was no drama in the main categories at all. And so that's what the, a lot of the thing was. And well, so, and most of the films aren't big hits. Yeah. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're you know. Eight, eight out of nine did not cross $100 million at the box. Yeah. Office. yeah. As opposed to, and I only bring this up because we talked about this year so much, is um, 1968 yeah. when you have... In the Heat of the Night, which ended up winning, going up against The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, yeah. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and also Dr. Doolittle. I mean, these are, at least four out of five of these are really important films, they're really popular films, and they represent like this crazy sea change in Hollywood and in the in the culture with the, with the older generation coming up against the younger generation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a dramatic Oscars. And, and today, you know, it's not that they're not good movies being honored, mm -hmm. they are good movies, but they aren't... I mean, if it had been, you know, Black Panther versus Wonder Woman versus Guardians of the Galaxy 2, huge popular movies. I'm yeah. not saying these are of the stature of Lawrence of Arabia. Right, right. Whatever. Right. But 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 like, those, those are movies that everyone saw. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's the mob. The mob rule. We got to, every once in a while, you got to cater to the mob. That's all I'm saying. Well, I think, you know, this is going to, this is a big stretch <laughs> I'm about to make. But when... When the people are united for good, yeah. then we're not going to call them the mob. That's right. They're just the people. They're the people. You know? Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> what are your final thoughts? On <sighs> My again? final thoughts are, uh, this is a eminently rewatchable film. And, you know, 
I know Steve said she, he's only seen it three or four times, but this is a film I watch on TNT, TBS all the time, and I own it and have it on Blu-ray. It's a film that I come back to a lot because of the journey of him and the nobility of him, and it's good to remember Russell Crowe before all the other nuttiness that happened after this, and you want to enjoy a performance. This is a performance, and it's an incredibly well-directed film, and it harkens back to the old sandal, uh, sword and sandal epics, but also put such a nice modern twist to the dialogue, modern twist to the connections, and some really strong performances from, from all the actors in the film. And it does it with a smile. There are moments of like genuine connection, genuine brotherhood that like you know and you understand and you felt and experienced in your life that you can connect to in the film. And in the long run, it's an interesting, different type of film because this villain is essentially in the same ballpark as uh, Javier Bardem's villain, a villain in No Country for Old Men, they're unusual villains. With the, they're not a lot of. There's a mustache twirling to the all villains, but there's a uniqueness to this kind of mustache twirling. So I give it so much credit, and it's a fantastic film that still holds up and one you can go back to all the time. That is a particularly creepy and greasy mustache it world is. in this one. Very much so. Um, so I, I have two thoughts. The one, the one thing is that I finally, in this last pass and doing all my research and thinking about it, mm. I finally figured out what it was that first time I saw it that made me not come back to it. And you know what helped me figure it out? What's that? Is the other movie that we've been prepping for, which I actually think is going to uh, air before this one, okay. is Ben-Hur. Yes. So for Easter. Yeah, for Easter. And so uh, Ben-Hur... There's a revenge story, mm -hmm. and the character goes on a long journey to finally have revenge on this person. But the revenge story is not the end of the movie in Ben-Hur. No. Is that in Ben-Hur, there are also these bigger themes of forgiveness and faith and, what, and, and letting go of violence and letting go of anger. Mm -hmm. And so while we do wrap up the, the revenge story by mm -hmm. killing Masala in the great chariot scene, yeah. we then go on because we haven't resolved the character. No, And the thing is in Gladiator is that there's also these bigger themes of the mob and Rome and mm -hmm. democracy and the Senate and power and all of these things right. to, and this discussion of what's going to happen with Rome. Right. Is that at that moment, my brain went, this is a movie about getting rid of a tyrant and the good man and his army, the general, yeah. saving Rome. And so when it became a movie about the gladiator fighting the, the emperor toe-to-toe, -to -toe, I actually didn't care about that as much. Interesting. And so that was not a satisfying ending. It's not that it's not a good fight scene. Mm. I think it's good, but that's not what I wanted to see because I was more interested, and I still am, you know, as, as we talked mm -hmm. about it, about this idea of the mob and the Senate and the emperor yeah. and the vision and what is Rome and what is the dream that is Rome and what is Marcus Aurelius's dream. Right. Those issues to me, I think were bigger than, than killing this bad guy who's Commodus. Yeah. I didn't care as much about that. And watching it this time, I... I still admire everything that I admire about it. I just, it's the ending that leaves me a little bit flat, I mm. think. Mm. Um, the Even though it's a, it's a good sequence and, and, and really everything's really well done. May I retort? Of course. Well, I think because you have two different protagonists. In, in, uh, in uh, Charlton Heston in Ben-Hur, he is more, he is on a, a spiritual journey, right? Yeah. There, there, it is, it's revenge only by happenstance. It's not revenge necessarily his entire goal. Right, because he was a prince, because he had all this kind of stuff, and then an accident happens that causes him to be uh, wronged, and then he has to do all this kind of stuff to go and get revenge. But the whole time, Jesus Christ is involved. There is no Jesus Christ for yeah. for uh, Maximus. There is right. only he's a pure person from beginning to end. Like he knows what he wants. There is no arc for Maximus. There, that's what's interesting about the film. He is just driven to achieve this revenge. He's a good man. He's a good man. He learns no lesson by the end. Uh, and then when he kills, he kills, but he leaves a message too saying, these are the words of Marcus Aurelius. So he does leave them with a blueprint of what to do next after he dies. So he's completed his mission that Marcus Aurelius gives him on the battlefield after they've won in the tent of what he wants Rome to be. So he's done, he's served his part. But with uh, Charlton Heston's character, with Judah, there's more uh, that he has to explore because of the because of the the, wo the woman because of who is I forget the character's name that is that is the old man that's guiding him every once in a while takes him to the Sermon on the Mount. 
Oh, uh, Balthazar. Balthazar, right. Because of all these other influences in his life driving him towards this, uh, this possibility of redemption through Jesus Christ, it's a different movie. But... I take the fact of why you wanted something more because it had that that feeling of an epic of a Ro- the old Roman right. epics that always had this religion to it, but this one his religion is the Valhalla thing and and all that. You know what? And, and the that's Elysian Gardens. I think you're totally right. Yeah. Because because Ben Hur is framed against uh, Jesus and Christianity mm-hmm. and those philosophies of forgiveness, of turn the other cheek, of of do good things to your enemies, right. all of those things. And those, because it's framed against those, that's what our character has to accept. Mm-hmm. Whereas Gladiator is frayed, framed against pagan spirituality yeah. and the afterlife, mm-hmm. which doesn't c- contain the same moral core as Christianity. Right. And so he doesn't have to resolve those things. No. That's a really, that's a great point. And they both, and one dies and one doesn't. Yeah. Right? Judah does not die, yeah. but uh, but uh, Maximus does die because he he is a warrior, he's a soldier, and this is his noble death. And he gets as, to go to Elysium to, exactly, to, he gets to see Elysium, with his family. And that's redemption. For him, that's redemption. Right. For Judah, the redemption is letting go of the anger after the uh, situation. That's Masala. a great point. Okay, I think that, that actually kind of <laughs> does resolve my thing. Good. Um, here's the other thing, and I think you really alluded to this, is that people don't understand how delicate making a film is. Mm. And that a successful film, in a weird way, is really a miracle. And and you look at Ridley Scott's career, and here's a guy who is equally talented when he makes, you know, whatever, you know, when he makes the Robin Hood movie as he was when he made Gladiator. Yeah. Um, and yet, for some reason, that talent is working well in one place and not in other places. Mm-hmm. You have all of these people, all of these actors, all these bringing all this hard work and talent to a thing. And very, very small things like they changed it from freedom to revenge. Mm. They killed the wife and the son. You know, that they decided that uh, this character would have a spiritual life and think about the afterworld. Mm-hmm. That they've created the the romantic or somewhat romantic relationship between him and Lucilla. And of course, that Oliver Reed passes away. Yeah. And all these little things happen. And then they have to scramble to deal with it. You know, the, they're changing production design schedules, rewriting scenes. Yeah. They're reshooting things. They've got body doubles. They're giving new scenes over here and over there. And somehow all of those things to ke- come together to make a great movie. Yeah. And, you, and a few of those things don't happen or happen differently and we wouldn't be sitting here talking about gladiator right now yeah, yeah. yeah that's really remarkable to me that's a good point. so that's what we think about gladiator of course we always want to hear what you think you can reach us on facebook at the cinephile c-i-n-e dash f-i-l-e-s please subscribe to us on itunes or if you prefer on spotify or on stitcher or on any of these other places um you can subscribe to us on youtube leave some comments there leave some reviews on itunes and of course if you want to support the show and even pick the next film that we do please support us on patreon patreon.com slash the cinephiles and as always you can reach me at sr morris john where can they reach you you can always reach me at the roca says on twitter and on instagram and thanks everybody for all the incredible comments that you've given to rachel online to all the people who have come on to be guests of the show it's uh, i've had more than one person who's been a guest on the cinephiles come up to me and go your fans are amazing yeah so i want to give a shout out to you all who really take the time to send these very sweet messages to the people who come on the show because sometimes in our business these people deal with a lot of backlash from other people online and so it's nice they come on to a show and be respected for their opinions and be beloved for the things that they say so i want to thank you all very much on the cinephile side of things absolutely i couldn't agree more and i think that's it for this week we will see you next time on the cinephiles <laughs>